Welcome to the Nova podcast. I'm Rebecca McFall, a violinist with the Fry Street Quartet, which is in residence at the Kane College of the Arts at Utah State University. And we're also currently serving as co-music directors for the Nova Chamber Music Series in Salt Lake City. This is episode six of the Crossroads series, and the subject is stories. Recently, my colleagues in the Fry Street Quartet and physicist Dr. Robert Davies premiered the film version of Rising Tide, The Crossroads Project, a multidisciplinary performance project addressing issues of global sustainability, which has inspired this series of podcast discussions as a forum to go deeper into the subjects the film brings up. So to talk a bit more about this project, uh, I'd like to introduce my co-host, my colleague, and full disclosure, my husband, Rob Davies. Hi, sweetie. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, as you've heard, uh, I am Rob Davies, co-creator of the Crossroads Project, along with my friends uh, and my wife in the Fry Street Quartet, who are artists in residence at Utah State University's Kane College of the Arts. So as Rebecca has just said, this is the last in our series of podcasts, which are produced in collaboration with the Nova Chain Music Series. Uh, and a quick shout out, by the way, to Chris Myers uh, with Nova, who has been uh, just a, an outstanding producer of these pods. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, and these pods are a part of the film premiere of our Rising Tide performance, as you just heard, which you can still view for free, by the way, on YouTube through the end of the year, courtesy of Nova Chamber Music Series. Uh, you'll find the link uh, here on the video. Go to the Nova Chamber Music uh, website and you can just follow your nose and find a link to that performance to see it if you haven't yet. Um, so if you've made it this far, though, uh, you know that uh, Rising Tide is this, as Rebecca said, intimate look at our planet, at ourselves, uh, at the intersection of these two and the paths that lie before us. And so we cover quite a lot of ground in this performance. Um, in just 70 minutes, and these podcasts have been a space for us to delve deeper into the topics that we cover, water, uh, the biosphere, life, food, uh, and society. But of course, Rising Tide is also an attempt to bring to bear the power of performance art on telling these important, critically important stories. And it is one of a growing number of such efforts. And in this, our final discussion, we've invited two artists who have been hugely effective and hugely active in using their professional lives uh, as performance artists to bring the stories of climate and global change to the world. Currently serving as composer in residence with the storied Philadelphia Orchestra and included in the Washington Post list of the 35 most significant women composers in history, identity has always been at the center of composer pianist Gabriella Lena Frank's music. Born in Berkeley, California, to a mother of mixed Peruvian and Chinese ancestry and a father of Lithuanian and Jewish descent, Gabriella explores her multicultural heritage through her compositions. Inspired by the works of Bela Bartok and Alberto Ginastera, Gabriella has traveled extensively throughout South America in creative exploration. Her music often reflects not only her personal experience as a multiracial Latina, but also refract her studies of Latin American cultures, incorporating poetry, mythology, and native music, musical styles into a Western classical framework that is uniquely her own. Moreover, she writes, there's usually a storyline behind my music, a scenario or, or character. Gabriella is on the, um, the G. Shermer roster um, and also is the recent recipient of the Heinz Award in the Arts and Humanities. So welcome, Gabriella. Well, thank you so much, Rebecca and Rob, for inviting me to be here with you this morning on such a, an important topic. It's, it's, I think the work that you're doing is extraordinary. And to be able to contribute you know, uh, my own experiences and my own thoughts uh, is, is very meaningful to me. Here in California, we've been coming through these really apocalyptic and devastating fires and recognizing this kind of threat is not something that was ever on my radar. I never thought about talking about the environment or talking about uh, any kind of climate distress as 
part of my story. I had my hands full with with talking about what it means to be a multicultural Native of America in this day and age and thought I had enough stories to witness and to talk about through my music. But the reality of these fires in recent years, it, it can't be denied and that the climate crisis is going to touch every corner of this planet and affect every single story that exists to be told. So in in recent years, if I've been really doing a retrospective of, of my life and understanding that I have a career of, of gratifying substance, that it was well incumbent upon me in high time for me to think beyond the content of my own work and to start thinking about the kind of leverage or the kind of confidence that that I had or leverage and confidence that has been invested in me to wield greater influence and a positive influence. And I think there is no greater goal than to save our planet so that we can keep on making music and we can keep existing as, as a human race and just a race of beings, human and non-human. So to that effect, a few years ago, a small academy that I founded using the connections that I had over a number of years and my own experiences in the concert world and traveling a lot in Latin America and writing my symphonies and the string quartets, I decided that I would create a safe space for my emerging siblings in composing. And we would make this a safe space for people that coming are coming in from non-Western cultures as well as those that are from the West and not only just from the West, but may not be within the classical canon. So they may be improvisers, they may be punk musicians or hip hop musicians. And and it has been a transformative experience. From the first year that we existed at a small academy out of my own home, providing residencies for these emerging voices to create works of art for incredible performers that mentor them, we were threatened by fire. And we had to, first we adjusted nominally. We, we rescheduled as I was accepting that, wow, we really do have a fire season. And in the second season, 2018 of our existence, when I was handing out masks to our composers as the nearby city of paradise was burning down, we were literally breathing its demise. I began to think this was our new reality. And what was the power of composers to be able to describe what was going on. So we've started to adjust and to try to provide opportunities for composers to first educate themselves and to come to grips emotionally. We're at the beginning of the journey. We're about to embark on uh, instilling a curriculum for this. And of course I need to model that in my own life. So I have been blessed with a, a, a good career, I think, the activity will continue and the next steps for me now that I hope to include in my my life story is that I've been able to facilitate a, a change of heart uh, within the music industry that contributes to the hastening of, of the of the environmental distress that we're experiencing, but also for the public at large. Fantastic. Wow. Thank you so much, Gabby. Um, and we're going to get into a lot more of what you're doing. I would like to also now take the opportunity to introduce our second guest, who is uh, Chantal Villadieu, uh, coming to us from her home in northern New Jersey. And Chantal is uh, the founder and artistic director of the Arctic Cycle, uh, with and one of the pioneers who's working at the intersection of theater and climate. And she has co-organized national gatherings and workshops. Full disclosure, I attended one of Chantal's workshops in New York City a couple of years ago. It was fabulous as a vehicle to help uh, emerging artists, and particularly in this case, theater artists, make their theatrical voices relevant on this topic of climate change. Uh, Chantal has published widely on this topic. Uh, and Chantel, I know you're a, a native of Montreal as well. And so bringing a, a, a further international perspective to the discussion as well. So um, thank you so much, Chantel, for uh, joining us. 
Thank you for inviting me and um, congratulations to you and Rebecca and to everybody involved in the film, which I think is really wonderful. And I'm so happy it exists and um, it can be watched. You know, anybody can have access to it and watch it. Um, so I am, uh, I am from originally from Montreal and I bring uh, a French accent to the discussion, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, so I'm trained as a playwright and um, something like 12 years ago, um, I went on a trip to Alaska as a vacation. And uh, because I knew somebody who lived there who had invited me to visit. And this was my first time um, that far north. It was my first time in Arctic territory. And it was, this was 2007. So it was one year after Al Gore's first documentary, An Inconvenient Truth, came out. And um, which means that the, the climate was more part of the mainstream conversation. And the combination of that and being in the Arctic where the effects, the impacts of, the, of climate change were so much more um, visible than in the rest of the US uh, made me want to see if I could bring that topic into my work. It had been a personal interest, but this, this was the first time that I started thinking, maybe I can write a play about this. And of course, in, uh, in doing research and getting interested in, in this idea, I felt more and more that artists had a role to play. And I felt like I wanted our voices to be heard and I wanted us to have uh, a way to contribute. Um, you know, if everybody's being called to lend a hand, artists should be part of that call. So I went from, uh, I, wrote, I wrote a play and uh, again, being from uh, Quebec, from Canada, I started looking at what was going on in the Canadian Arctic because of course, the Arctic territory in Canada is huge uh, compared to the US, let's say, you know, Alaska is a small proportion of the entire US territory, but the Canadian Arctic is really big. Mm -hmm. And I wrote my first play, uh, it's called Sila, which is set in the Canadian Arctic. And in pr it premiered in 2014. And in working on that, um, I felt that there was much more to say than I could say in one play. And so I thought, okay, I'm gonna write another play and maybe more after that. But in order to have this work be somewhat cohesive, I was trying to, uh, I looked for some kind of container. And of course the Arctic uh, Council has, I discovered the Arctic Council has eight countries, uh, eight, member, eight members who represent the eight countries that have Arctic territories. And so I thought, okay, I'm gonna write a play for each of these countries, which that, that means eight plays and on that topic. And um, it's a huge endeavor. I'm on number three <laughs> at the moment. So one and two have been written, <laughs> produced, published. I'm on number three, and my biggest hope is that I get to the end of the series before I die. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and then uh, after that, we can get on uh, about the other stuff uh, later in the conversation. But um, after that, I went on to create other programs because I was looking for things that didn't exist. But this was sort of this is my origin story, let's say. <laughs> so I mean, this is pretty. I find both of these stories fascinating. And the, and the thing that I think really connects them in my mind is, uh, Gabby, you really sort of, what, what brought this into your professional sphere was the, was the, ex was the experience you were having with the fires. Uh, and Chantal, what brought this into your professional sphere uh, was the, your personal experience uh, in the Arctic and with climate change. And so, of course, climate change is progressing quite rapidly. Uh, and I'm wondering if, so you've both sort of, you've both made large professional commitments to really address this in your professional works, it, but I'm assuming that's evolving. And maybe I'll start with you, Chantal, because you started maybe in 20, a bit earlier, so call it 10 years ago, you're gonna write eight plays, you're on number three, but of course, in the time that you started, the progress of climate change has really stepped up dramatically. Is this is this changing your thought as to what you're going to write? 
um, it, this was part of my, this was part of what was interesting to me is because I knew just because of how the, the theater industry works and also my own rhythm, I knew it was going to take me a long time. And, you know, uh, there's what each play is going to say, but there's also what the cycle as a whole is going to say. And because I knew it was going to be long, I, I'm hoping that the plays uh, are going to reflect our evolving relationship with the issue. So that's that's it, it, you get this built-in flexibility to do that. It, yeah. As you tell me. Yeah. What about you? Have you so a few years ago you you really uh, took to this, but of course uh, I can't even begin to describe how much has changed in just the last few years. Yeah, our feet were literally <laughs> held to the fire, and you know, with every year. We just went through our fourth season. You know, 2017 was here in California when this latest wave and devastating wave of fires started. And a lot of us wrote it off. It's just a particularly bad year because California, every 10 years or so, has a really bad fire season. Um, and I had an urban night view on it living in the Bay Area and being a native of the Bay Area for so long that it's I thought of it as, well, that's the price you pay. You want to live in the rural interface. You have to accept that fire is going to hit your area every 10 years or so. And and I didn't book a lot of sympathy, to be perfectly honest. And then in 2018, the fire hit, and it was even worse. 2019, evacuation hit the coastline. 2020, millions of acres were burned. Each year, it's just so dramatically, so, so much worse. And we know people now. We know people. So the urgency is not going to wait for a typical concert season in which commissions are brokered and come to fruition three, four years after the initial discussion. Symphony orchestras plan out five to ten years often. And, and you know, we have, what, nine more years before we hit that tipping point. They talk about the year 2030. That's just around the corner. And so... Um, there is a, a certain amount of urgency, um, devising projects in which we can get composers more quickly up to speed and to, you know, in the initial rounds of, com of commissioning that I would like to do of, of my alums from my academy, I'm looking at the ones that have the skill sets and may have gone through some of these experiences already. Um, in this initial group, I'm looking at several native Californians who have been thinking about this and experiencing this already because in order for our stories to be authentic, it takes time. Artistic work that's here takes time. To come in with an angle that will not dissipate like cotton candy, <laughs> sweet, and then just go away, they don't really uh, leave a dent in your psyche. And so um, we, we need to strategize about how people can delve into the experience that they already have while training the next generation, You know, su succeeding artists to tell these stories. I wonder if um, if you could talk a little bit more about delving into the psyche and and kind of uh, what so what what are you hoping to inspire with um, bringing this urgency kind of into your professional work? I'd love to hear from both of you, but since you used those words, Gabby, maybe you can speak to that a little bit. Well, I think they're mutual words. You and I have talked about that ideal place between alarm and aspiration. Yeah. And frankly, I, you know, using this wonderful imagination that all of us artistic types are supposed to wield every day in and out, we're supposed to imagine what a green planet looks like. And I, I you know, I'm 48 years old now, so I'm about to move into the second half of my life because I'm determined to hit 100. I want to know <laughs> what it looks like when we come through the other side, what a green planet looks like when everybody accepts that we're part of this effort to repair the earth and get it back to where it was in, in our childhood when, when, when birds sang all the time and insects just streamed out of the garden. I mean, this is how things were. Butterflies were like abundant. And, and I slowly realized that's not just a romanticized childhood memory. That really was how things were. <laughs> and we artists can tell those stories because the inclination is for people to throw up their hands is to enter a mental and psychic, really, you know, paralysis, saying, what do you mean I can't fly? I have to put food on the table. What is my artistic life going to look like when I can't take that prestigious gig in New York City? 
how, and I can't argue with my my employers that want me to take a tour around the country that is completely n- not ethical from from a from an eco standpoint. So there's also the journey of of grieving that I think we don't talk about a lot. And I remember when it hit me when I really just sat and I said, "My life is in danger." I'm looking at this smoke. My life is in danger. And I just sat there like a rock. And my whole life just caught up with me. The fact that I've built a major career on the back of a lot of carbon <laughs> you know, yes. and flying. And I was grieving that my planet really wasn't the same as it was that I remember from my, my girlhood. And and uh, perhaps if you're artistic, you, you really feel things sometimes, you know, and we pour it into <laughs> our and we pour it into our, our plays and our, our prose, but we have to move on this. And we have, we, ha- we have strength, we really do. And we can channel you know, that grief into the stories, but also provide a way for artists to grieve. And, and, but we can't take a lot of time just to stay in grief. We can <laughs> grieve and move at the same time. We, we have to. You know, Chantel, I, I mean, this notion of grief that Gabby brought up, that uh, you and I have talked about this a little bit. And in conjunction with, uh, you know, with this question that Rebecca's probing is just the psyche of the people that are uh, participating, collaborating with you. And in, in your case, Chantel, you run um, seminars and workshops. I know I think you get a pretty strong interest in participation. Uh, the people that are coming, do they have personal experience with a climate change and B are they sort of w- this notion of grief? What what level is that playing with the people you're working with? Um, Gabriella, I'm glad you brought up grief because um, it's such an important thing, and we there's no uh, cultural um, mechanism to deal with that to deal with like climate grief, I guess. So I think the art are playing an important part in that. The people who come to my workshops, it depends. Sometimes they're, um, a lot of times they're university students who will uh, be more or less knowledgeable about climate um, and who who will be, I mean, in, in the case of university students, I encounter them only for a short period of time. So I don't have the same uh, in into how they're feeling maybe as a professor would who's seen them for a semester. Usually they're pretty anxious and um, worried about the planet, especially if they're coming to a seminar that I'm teaching. I mean, th- that's the subject matter. So they're already um, in tune with it. In terms of the incubator, which is the one you participated in, Rob, um, it, it attracts uh, a mix of uh, professional artists, uh, either some at the very early stages of their career, some more experience. Um, uh, scientists, activists, um, educators, it's kind of across the board. And the the um, comment I get again and again is to the comfort of being in a room with other people who are feeling the same way. So I think everybody who's working on on climate and across the board, it can be a very lonely pursuit. And it's certainly uh, emotionally tax- taxing. So it's reassuring, I think. And we get energy from being with other people who are doing similar work and who are thinking similarly because we're like, okay, you know, I even though my part may not be working well or may, even though I may be really tired, somebody's doing great stuff. And, oh, my God, I have, you know, if they're doing it, I have to do it too. So uh, that's that maybe that's where the the grief um, plays out in uh, the way I encounter people is the being able to counter it in a way, being able to find in the same way you would when you go to a memorial, right? It's like I'm feeling pain, but there's all these people around me who are feeling the same thing, and I'm I'm getting strength from that. So I think the incubator functions a little bit the same way. I, and I'm going to follow that up. I know I'm quite certain Rebecca is like busting with all kinds of questions for both of you. <laughs> so I'm going to get mine in while I have a chance, uh, this one, which is um, within your professions then. So uh, Chantal, you're working within this much broader profession of theater, uh, Gabby within this much broader profession of composing uh, and classical music. Um, 
Are you feeling support or are you feeling like you're having to buck the system? Uh, you know, I guess that's, uh, let me, let me leave it. How, how are you feeling within your profession doing what you're doing? You, does it feel risky? Uh, liberating, maybe a little of both. Uh, Chantal, let's start with you and then we'll go to Gabby. Um, I'm going to refer again to what Gabriella said earlier. She said something about, uh, you know, it takes, it takes a long time to commission somebody to get a piece done. And it's certainly the same in the theater. And so I guess my short answer would be you have to buck the system because the system is not designed for this. The system is not designed to move fast. Um, it's not designed to be responsive. Um, I, it's probably the same in the music industry, but in the theater, you know, big theaters, they're programmed two years in advance. So they're not set up to respond to anything. And they're also not set up to um, push the boundaries to a certain extent because they're dependent on who on people filling in the seats you know they they need an audience and so they they have to be a little careful about what they offer where the most of the work is happening is in smaller companies the ones who are nimble who don't have to worry you know who have no money to start with so they don't they don't <laughs> worry about losing it <laughs> um and uh young people who uh don't have a, a career uh behind them of doing things differently they're again more uh, willing to uh, try different things take risks and um and it's it can be depending on where you are in the country. It's still like weirdly a controversial issue. So you know, there's it's, the work happens mostly I think on the coast and in uh, large urban areas. But otherwise, it's hard to um, push this topic into more rural areas or areas where there's still a lot of denial of climate science. Gabby, what about you? Well, I, I can't add a single thing. I mean, you could take out the word theater and just put in music. <laughs> Every single thing you said, Chantal, completely applies a thousand percent. Um, and I, I would add that, you know, with the young people, because they haven't invested their identity so much in the expenditure of carbon the way we have, they, you look at them, they're more vegan than the generations coming before. And a lot of them are already saying, we're not gonna have kids, you know, because we don't have time and, and, and why would we? And I can very easily envision a future where they're boycotting events in which the guests flew in, that we're, not, we're gonna lose this audience for theater and, and, and um, music, the, the mystique of the celebrity outsider, the, the exotic, European, I don't know, violinist coming in to do a concert is not going to be of interest. And so there are deep cultural values that need to shift. That said, I think this past year, this pandemic has been such a violent and hard reset for all of us where we are doing and imagining things we previously thought completely antithetical, completely impossible and sacrilegious to even entertain mm -hmm. doing anything online for an art form like theater and music, which really depends on being in person, uh, a lightning would come down from the sky if you should ever suggest that. And yet some really interesting new art forms are coming out from this. Um, but also looking at diversity and there's abundant evidence to show that when we educate girls and we educate people of color, that that is a climate action. And so to give voice to their stories you might unintentionally talk about environmental racism, for, into, for, for instance. So that this year has given us, has just opened the door on multiple angles in which to talk about the climate crisis uh, hidden under diversity, you know, mm -hmm. uh, diversity initiatives or uh, including more uh, voices from women. So I think now at the time when people are more open to, to different kinds of solutions to also talk about, well, you know, health epidemics are more likely on a warming planet. And we want this pandemic is you know, climate crisis and in action, we are in it. And if you, you know, when I bring that up to some of my peers, you see them just freeze for a moment, it suddenly became real, just like mm -hmm. 
the way they checked in on me. Are you still alive there in California? Each fire is getting worse. And I really had that kind of reaction. So we're at a unique time when the theater world and the music world may speed up, may become nimble and like a smaller organization, may lean on the urgency that young people are feeling and and one can hope. And I think those of us that are conscious of it, now working from the inside of our respective industries need to push and to say, keep, keep innovating, keep trying new things, uh, speak the language of, of the present urgency that a lot of these organizations are feeling, but with a, with a larger impact beyond when, we, when this specific crisis begins to ease. If, if I could hop in for a second, I, I love this dis discussion about moving the industry and, and becoming nimble and the lessons of the pandemic. And just, you know, I always return back to this notion of, of sustainability and the arts. You know, this is not an unfamiliar concept to any artist to become sustainable just as an individual, as an artist is a big deal. And, and once you start, um, you know, thinking about that concept inside this crisis, you start seeing all the layers um, that actually without addressing the big existential sustainability crises, you know, our very own sustainability as, with careers in, in the arts is also at risk. But to pivot to the, the hopeful message, um, the lessons of the pandemic about, about needing to pivot quickly and trying new things, I think maybe does have us in a more experimental activist mindset, possibly. And when you look at the numbers for the carbon budget and the scientists telling us that we've got basically eight years from this point to, yeah, to, uh, uh, to make this, well, to make this transformation, of course, the transformation has to ha happen now in order us, for us to meet that deadline. Um, what I, what I dream of or love to imagine is what would this mean for us all to have all hands on deck, both with our messaging um, through our art forms to change hearts and minds and mindsets, but also in our actions in our industries. So that just at every turn, we're normalizing adjustments and the ways in which we reimagine a way forward. We have, you know, um, block booking for, for artists as a member of a string quartet, I don't know how many times I'm ashamed to say, you know, I've flown across the entire country to give one or two concerts. Um, it's a huge carbon footprint. And, and I love making music with an audience. I, you know, uh, that's what I've spent my life hoping to do. But we can reimagine this. We can strengthen our local communities and, and there are our arts within our, our communities, I think. And, um, uh, and anyway, I just, I wonder if along these lines, uh, I could ask each of you to talk a little bit more about, about some of the reimagining maybe that you've done. What, what do you see that, that could be transformational, um, either inside the, the art form itself and the messaging or in practices, anything at all? Um, maybe, uh, maybe Gabby, I'll throw it back to you because I know we've, talked a little bit about this already. Well, I think uh, you mentioned one big one about the, the block booking and the, the restriction clauses that make it really difficult for a musician to come in and pick up six local concerts or be on the road for a month and then largely, you know, stay home. And um, one thing that we have just begun to launch at My Tiny Academy, and we are one of those nimble very low budget organizations, you know, it's literally out of my house. So I set the rules if it's in my house, as long as I have the $5 that it takes to get something going. But one thing that we um, have started, we're calling it the Chosky Music Series, a decarbonized concert experience. And we just had the premiere uh, last week, a solo violin work in the Chosky uh, coming from my mother's culture in Peru, the Chosky was, uh, was the runner that was allowed in an official capacity on the Inca road, which was our version through Bolivia, Peru, and in Latin America of the Silk Road, uh, the Cam uh, Camina, Camino del Inca. So 
the idea is that we would commission from our alums a, a solo work. In this case, it's violin, and then line up a dozen violinists around the world that will commit to playing it. So this way, the music does travel without that premiering violinist needing to get on a plane. And we would ask each of these chaskis, these 12 chaskis, to take photographs and videos and to have a small audience. It could be three people, it could be a big one once we, once we ease out of the pandemic. And then we would collect together a collage of all these performances. And so every composer, when they write a piece of music, just like a, when a playwright writes a play, you wonder if it's gonna have a life beyond the premiere. So getting that, uh, that successive line is really, really important. We would be able to do that. And so we have violinists lined up in Monaco and South Africa and Asia, across the US and, and my good schoolmate in Chile to give us the Latin American premiere there of this work that is composed by Anjana Swaminathan, who's a Carnatic Indian musician who wrote it for uh, a really esteemed classical violinist, Hey Young Yoon here, who just premiered in New York last, last year. So our idea is to to show how we were able to spread the music through multiple musicians in a highly beneficial way without needing to get on a plane. And we asked the musicians, this has to be in your hometown or where you live. We don't want you to get on a plane and, and do that, you know. Um, but if it's included, then, then we have some guidelines. So for instance, we're encouraging, trying to in, uh, introduce the violinists themselves to this idea of rethinking how they make music. See, we're not advocating just to a pub. We're actually look, talking to each other within the industry. And that's really, really necessary to model how they can have a vibrant career if we think about these other ways. And who else but we insiders? You know, Chantal can think of these things that she knows are, is necessary. And I can think of these things and pay everybody we have. is not very much in the first year, but uh, the goal is to model it. Once it's modeled, we have something to show to donors so they understand what's going on and they see this incredible talent and commitment. It's much easier to, to pull in the funds to grow the program. Ah, oh, that's great. Um, Chantel, along this line, this very line, I know you have a project, this, this project of a, uh, I want to make sure I get the title right away. Climate Change Theater Action. Um, and uh, earlier, Gabby mentioned uh, the emphasis on uh, cultural diversity as well and bringing into all of this voices that have uh, often not had large stage or, or, or real voice. Uh, and I know that this year, your Climate Change Theater Action project has as a focus uh, the Green New Deal. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit first, what is the this, uh, pro this, this effort and then and then why the Green New Deal? Yeah, Climate Change Theatre Action uh, was created in 2015. And it was uh, an idea that I and three other colleagues came up with. Um, and the concept of a theater action already existed in a somewhat different form. So we took that and we expanded on it. So essentially what we do is, um, it's I like uh, hearing what Gabriella said because there are a lot of similarities. Um, we commission 50 playwrights from around the world. So every continent is represented to write a short play, uh, five minutes long about uh, an aspect of climate change based on a prompt. Then that gives us a collection of 50 plays and we make these plays available uh, within a time, certain time window, which is in the fall to coincide with the United Nations COP meetings. And we say to people, um, you can take one or several of these plays and present an, an event in your community. And please feel free to add other materials, you know, from musicians, um, other artists, other playwrights that you know, but essentially as long as you use one play, you can be part of this project. And then um, we, we provide support. We put all of the events on our website. We publicize them on social media. Um, at the end, we ask for feedback from people. We, uh, we ask for feedback, oh, uh, just how it went, but also in terms of numbers, who organize, how many people organized it, how many people attended. And we ask for uh, photos and footage when they have them. And the, the goal of the project is, um, 
So how how the project came up is somebody at some point asked me, what do you think needs to happen now? This was in 2015. And I said, there needs to be more playwrights writing about this. And because if it's just me, it's going to take way too long, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's how we came up with the idea. So it's like, okay, we need to get playwrights interested in a topic and familiar with the topic. And then we need to get these stories out there so people have a way to come together and talk about this issue without it being a scientific lecture or something that's very political. So it's a place where you can be highly subjective um, when you can talk to your neighbors, right? Uh, it's in the community. Uh, it's theater is very local, just like live music. And um, it's very exciting for playwrights. You know, even though it's a short play, um, sometimes their, their plays will be done 20 times in like 10 different countries, you know, within a space of two, two three months, which never happens in real life. Um, <laughs> so, and the, the project has been, I mean, we didn't know we did that on the fluke, like, let's see what happens. And it has been more successful than I ever expected. And it grows every time. We do it every other year because it's such a huge endeavor. And um, the last time in 2019, we had over 220 events in 28 countries. And the play, the 50 plays collectively were presented over a thousand times and we reached 25,000 people. So and the other part of the project also is when you're um, anybody who's doing something, uh, you know, depending on your resources, bigger or smaller. But if you if I have if I do an event and 25 people show up compared to the scale of the problem, it feels it feels insignificant and, you know, it can be discouraging. But if you have. Uh, you know, 220 people putting up an event at the same time, then it feels like you're part of a movement. It's like, I'm, it's the same concept as being in one room together, right? It's like, mm -hmm. here are all these other people around me and I'm going to gain energy from them and I'm going to put energy into the pot <laughs> and we're all going to be stronger at the end. So that, that project, um, and it's also a way to, um, my expertise is, in, is not in sustainability. I have colleagues who look very closely at that in terms of like building materials, um, energy consumption, buildings, all of that related to the theater. But definitely it's a way to have work travel without anybody getting on a plane since everything is very local. Um, and it's a way to uh, be able to, ex to um, bring together the local and the global since the plays are from all over. So you can have somebody presenting a play from New Zealand in Canada, let's say, and maybe the indigenous rights issues will be similar, right? And so then you get a sense of how things work across the world, but you can relate it to your own experience. Oh, and one thing I would like to add. <laughs> when we talked about the, the purpose of stories, um, there's a study that was done uh, not too long ago, I think by the Yale Climate Change Communication Project, I think the name is. And um, the number of people in the US who talk about climate change with their friends and families is very low, very low, like less than 50%. And unless we're able to, to normalize this and bring it into the culture and be able to talk, it, talk about it every day, we're not gonna be able to take action. So sometimes, you know, it can, even I tell myself sometimes, well, it's, it's a play really, you know, <laughs> it's a play, how much is it gonna change the world? But what it's doing is it's bringing the topic more and more into conversation. And if people encounter a play and then a concert and then hear a song on the radio and read a book, suddenly it becomes part of the zeitgeist and it's something that um, we can, it's not this thing out there that we have to deal with. It's just part of our lives. It's something I sometimes call an ecosystem of messaging, right? We get, we get sort of, we need to be continually pulsed from different places in our lives. And, and, and hopefully we're all here trying to create those pulses. Gabby, you had your hand up. You were bursting. With <laughs> <laughs> I did, you know, um, Chantal, I was uh, listening to you and, and I was just responding artist to artist when I, you know, we composers, when there's like a text or a poem or a play that could be a, a libretto for an opera, we, we, we want to jump on it. And um, I just felt that kind of like, oh my goodness, I'm, I have to look at all this material. And uh, when this podcast is over, I would love to talk with you 
and <laughs> look at all of these wonderful artwork and get to see what maybe I could compose something to or bring to life in a, in a small opera or my composers. Um, because, you know, we have an army of talent and an army of mess messengers, basically. And um, there is a, a confluence of benefit, I think, that can happen when, when we do normalize these conversations and we do so within the, our artistic circles as well as outside. Um, I think like attracts like, which is what this quartet of voices is, is proving where we have to normalize, find one another, magnify our intentions and efforts. And um, I'm, I'm having that kind of you know, response to this magnificent project that you've stewarded into life. I do believe messages have to be reiterated again and again and again. And from, from unexpected places and from trusted voices and unknown voices and a variety of, of different angles and in the news, but in art, I mean, it's, it just has to happen again and again and again. And again, our industry is not necessarily built for that. It's built for the splashy premiere that uh, is often the bulk of, of a person's income. When you, you depend on these commissions and you may get some royalties that trickle in for the scant performances to happen elsewhere. But uh, if we can, if we address climate change, we're also going to change the field. The two go hand in hand. I, I really don't see how addressing climate change in a, in a meaningful way, a climate crisis, I should say, in a meaningful way can happen with the existing mores and the existing mechanisms of, of how art is produced and disseminated and enjoyed. It's, it's just not, um, it's not necessary enough if you follow this this path. I love all of that. I, I wonder, um, Chantal, you you said something that is is uh, dear to my heart about about creating this cultural space for these conversations and for this messaging away from the political arena or, or you know just create normalizing it through you know talking to your neighbor neighbors about it and and um, that was very much um, the inspiration for for Rising Tide, actually, because the concert hall is a safe space. People go there, um, and uh, you can. Oh, wow, there's just so so much potential to move the conversation away from places where that conversation is is currently stuck or hindered, and uh, uh, so I, I'm just I'm inspired by by uh, both of you <laughs> and all that you're doing to, to kind of uh, claim that space for, for change. Well, congrats to you for bringing us together. I mean, it's really the film, right? And the project that is bringing all of these wonderful people. I watched some of your, your other podcasts and um, yeah, it's all, all my congrats to you for doing this. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. You know, I'm, I was struck by something else that Gabby, I think you said, and we just have a few minutes left, but um I think this is a kind of a nice place to to round back to. So, you know, my my original inspiration was I want to enlist the arts to help <laughs> me tell the story, uh, and of course, uh, not uh, unreasonably, artists will sometimes bristle at having themselves enlisted <laughs> for something <laughs> other than the art. You know, the art is here for this, um, but in fact, this is what you're you're both doing. You're you're saying, and I think expanding that notion, saying no. You can't just enlist us. We're, we're going to enlist you <laughs> to help us change the world. And both of you are not just creating works that draw attention to these issues and open up space for the conversations and promote them. You're also training other artists. You've, you've, you've both created little factories in which you're trying to bring in uh, artists and have them become a part of this this effort, this storytelling, in whatever way makes sense to them. But to do that, of course, you've, bo you've both said you need those artists to know the story uh, of climate change, of global change, of and, and all the connections to that social, all kinds of aspects of social justice, all aspects of it. Uh, and you've both built that into your work. And I wonder if you might just talk a little bit about how it is your 
helping your community learn these stories. And I'll just say that in the class that I teach for fine arts and humanities students, their final project is to retell the scientific story in their own artistic voices. And my only rule for them is you can't, you, my, my rule is you don't have to get the science right, but you can't get it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm wondering if you might talk about how it is you're helping your artists uh, uh, do that. And we've got about maybe 10, uh, five or 10 minutes left. Um, Chantel. What, so you, you bring in these workshops, you want them to know the story. And I already know the answer to this, but I'm going to ask you to talk. About <laughs> well, I say it's not your job to, to teach the science. <laughs> Good. Yeah. You know, you have to understand it, but it's not the job of the artist to teach the science because we're not scientists, right? It's not our job to do this. We're, we're going to get it wrong. I mean, you can do something that's very much inspired by science, but and that includes science. But the, the end goal is not to teach the science. The end goal is to open up uh avenues for explorations is to pose questions that we maybe can all pose together or answer together and so the science becomes uh a way to ground the story you're going to tell and depending on who's telling the story and what story they want to tell sometimes they don't even need to know that much of the science you know if you're going to write a story about escaping a wildfire in California, it doesn't matter what the science is. Like it's a very personal story about a lived experience. If you're gonna tell a story about the evolution of the world, then you should know, you know a little bit more. So it, it's all um, contextual, but I think the most important point is don't try to, and another thing I say is don't repeat the headlines. We're reading the headlines. We're overwhelmed by the headlines. We don't need a, a play or you know a story like anything that's going to repeat that. You have to find another way in that's not a scientific lecture. That's not what we read in the newspaper. So this is where the art artistry comes. I think is that what is the story that haven't been that hasn't been told yet that you feel should be out there. Beautiful, Gabby. Yeah, you know, I, I again, I absolutely agree. And I think that artists really respond well when they see one or two examples of something that is revealing connections that haven't been made before. And so again, you know, if you if you read the headlines, that's pretty clear. But if you tell the intimate story of somebody that is, is experiencing that headline within the scope of their life, and you do so in a beautiful choreography or a piece of music or in a dance that's going to hit people in their hearts, despite their political persuasion and, and, and other things. And um, so when I talk about this, and I'm in a very preliminary phase, really, of instilling this curriculum, and, and although I have been talking about it with my composers, it's only been recently that I've been letting them into my thought process as I'm weighing which stories to tell and is music the best medium and which music form should this be with words or should it be purely instrumental? Should it be symphonic? Should it be choral? So I have a gig coming up with a, a fantastic youth choir, for instance. And I said, imagine the power. I don't know what they're going to say, but imagine the power of children saying, what are you leaving us with? The young voices <laughs> doing this. But then I have to talk about don't, don't, you know, scare the kids too much. And yet this is, <laughs> What I'll do is I'll read these articles that are abundant advice for parents, how to talk about the climate crisis with kids. And that helps me approach the words, the text, the music. What it, It's like I'm their parent for a little while. And then <laughs> what's the reaction of the audience, the, the guilt or the, the parents that are among them in the audience? You have to think about that. So I talked to the composer about how I'm approaching it. And I, and I might you know start strategizing, even though I don't have that piece fully formed yet, but I have an entry point in to start finding my way. Another that uh, Rob and, and Rebecca know about is strategizing larger connections. And so I had a gig with the Philadelphia Orchestra and the piece was postponed its premiere because of the pandemic. That was supposed to react to Beethoven, this being a huge Beethoven year, the anniversary, uh, 250 years uh, anniversary for Beethoven. And so it's kind of a classic uh, classical music response is to go back and honor, you know, this giant that is not really um, symptomatic of, of 
our diversity and, and our, our our championing of current voices. And I was, I was able to bring in three composers from my academy to respond to different symphonies. The orchestra agreed to that and uh, because of this relationship that we have. Mm -hmm. And the composers were uh, one African-American, one Iranian, Canadian, and uh, a young woman So and myself. So was, the four of us are very diverse. I was able to you know, get that going, which is really beautiful. And then uh, two of us responded to the environment. And I said, this is an amazing platform. And why would a response to Beethoven invite a discussion about the climate crisis? And so uh, Iman Habibi, my Iranian Canadian composer, said, well, Beethoven loved the forest. He got his best ideas by walking through this healthy forest, which we don't have anymore. That's in peril. So did that in peril genius and creativity? And I talked about the fact that Beethoven, I had a choral component because I was responding to the, the Ninth Symphony, the Ode to Joy, with that big choral component that is recognizable in, in big action scenes and prisoners of war and various wars have sung it to their captives. I mean, it has an incredible history. So um, I, uh, I said, you know, Beethoven lived during the Industrial Revolution, and this was the time when you start finding people complaining about pollution. This is the backdrop to his entire life. And the Industrial Revolution was propelled by colonizing Latin America and, and other parts of the world. So this is a fantasy. Beethoven's going to meet somebody from Latin America who is a fellow artist, a member of the Cusco School of Painters. And the Cusco School were these anonymous indigenous painters of Peru conscripted into artistic evangelism. They were taught the Flemish style of painting in order to evangelize the natives. And they were largely anonymous. But as the movement went on over many decades, they began to sign their paintings. They began to include emblems of Peruvian landscape while the Peruvian landscape was changing. And so the message is that you are harming our environment. We're trying to save it. We're putting it out into the inhospitable land. And so Pachamama is asking, what of odes finally when that land today is in peril? When these animals that I'm hiding in my paintings that are native to Peru and not to Europe are no longer here. When these beautiful rivers are, are, ex are exploding into oily fire because of oil spills. And it's really startling when you can make these large juxtapositions that talk about the consequences from centuries ago landing now in the environment. And this draws on what I already know. I already know about Latin American idioms. And, and so what we have to tell our artists too is that you have 90% of what you need already. The 10% of education is to help you connect the climate crisis to what you know. You, like, like what Chantel was saying, you don't have to be scientists. And use that imagination. This takes time. I didn't have this beautiful story clear in my head when I first started the piece. I had an instinct that there's something to explore here. And I got it at the, at the bar line. I got the whole thing <laughs> you know, right as I was in it. So you have to teach your artist courage. This is a this is an, a, a, a new area that not a lot of artists have explored yet. And they have to use the skills that they already have and find their answers in it, which can be hard when everything's publicly premiered. You don't have the privacy to fail so much. And, and we don't have a lot of time for that. So there, there's a... Um, and so I talk about that with my composer. You're asking about how how do we train our artists into it? I, you know, I, I would just like to say that 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 entire description of how this story connecting the Latin American painters, the Peruvian painters, this is not a, a storytelling device that would ever occur to a physicist, I can promise you. <laughs> <laughs> and it's so exactly right. This is what you said, Gabby, of this notion of we have everything we need scientifically, technologically. Uh, what we don't seem to have is the cultural ability at the moment to make these changes. And of course, this is what you guys do is connect us to these stories in ways that actually evolve our culture. And, and, um, I just, Rebecca, I, uh, you know, we need to thank our guests one more yes. time. I just want to thank you so much both for the things that you do. Um, and thank you so much for joining us uh, uh, for this conversation. Yes, thank you. You're both extraordinary. And I love the idea, too, of just leaving it 
on the notion of courage. <laughs> so thank you so, so much. And, um, and we have a few sponsors to thank in closing as well. Uh, our, our 2020-21 season sponsors are the Utah Legislature and the Utah Division of Arts and Museums, the Lawrence T. and Janet T. D. Foundation, the Salt Lake County Zoo and Arts and Parks, the George S. and Dolores Eccles Foundation, Isotope, Salt Lake City Arts Council, Cultural Vision Fund, Dominion Energy, Rocky Mountain Power Foundation, the Alice M. Ditson Fund of Columbia University, and the Aaron Copeland Fund for Music. So thank you to all our sponsors as well. And, um, and thank you for listening. <laughs>